This is Jonathan Agoff here for Pro Boxing Fans. We're up here in Sheffield today, a massive fight night on Saturday night. I'm joined by renowned trainer Dominic Ingle. Dominic, two big fights that you've been training for. Kel Brook against Mark DeLuca and Kid Galahad final eliminator against Marrero. Let's start with Kel. You said, well, he, he's returned to the gym and you've had him since nine years old. So has it been very natural, sort of, the return with him? Yeah, look, he's, you know, he's been here since we were 10 years old. They come and they go, they, they have fights and they disappear for three or four months you know and then they come back and train for another camp so you know when he when he left he'd, he'd only really been out of the gym for maybe six months up to that fight and then he came back yeah he probably he, in total he'd probably been out a year but he, you know it's not it's not like he was missed in the sense that you know nobody ever thought he was going to come back he was always welcome to come back any time it was no big deal to be honest um, you know we got other kids training for fights and we, we were we were quite active we got other kids Liam Williams Richardson so it's not like it left a big gap and sometimes people need to go on their own journey and find themselves and I think that's what Kel's done over the last year and a half he, he, he left he had a fight he got through the fight and he's back in the gym and it's not you know it's no big deal to be honest people like to make a uh, an argument out of a big story there's a big fallout but I've known him all his life and I've had some of the best times with Kell Brook so there's never going to be a fallout it's people have a choice in life and you have to respect what the choices are whether you think they're right or wrong choices it's not really your opinion it's theirs it's their choice so it was never an issue to me I mean knowing Kell as well as you do what have you is there anything new you've sort of seen to add since sort of the last fight you can listen you can never add to a fight at 30 odd years old look they, they know everything they've been there it's more of being them being a bit wise more wise the self and you know he's, he's probably learned himself a, less, a lot of lessons in the time he's been away from the gym and a lot of them lessons he'll just keep to himself he's a quiet kid really um, and I think more than anything he's just found himself he's, he's realised where he's in life what life's all about and you know he's been at the top of his game he's been famous he's had all these angers on and I think these last couple of fights they've all disappeared and that's what happens and we have a conversation and he said you know I've now find myself you know when I was coming through at 25 26 and people like Johnny Nelson and Junior Witter were finishing the career you know I'm, I, that's where I am now I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my career uh, he says I'm, I'm over the other side of the hill I'm coming down the hill and it's about keeping yourself relevant and keeping yourself safe and you know Saturday night will be a big, uh, a big fight for Kel because it's going to determine whether he can go on in boxing for the next 12 to 18 months or not. And we'll have to have a close look at him. And if he puts in an all right performance, then we have to measure that performance against the opponents he could potentially face. And there's a lot of young kids out there, there's a lot of killers out there. And at 34 years old, you don't want to be going against somebody who's 24 years old who's knocking everybody out. You know, it might be great for the fans, but you have to think about the fighter. And if you care about fighters, you don't sling them in the kind of fights. So, you know, we'll see. Let's just see what happens on Saturday night with Kel Brook. So from what you're saying, and it might sound obvious, but it's because you've known him so long, do you, see, do you see yourself as more of a trainer, more of a mental figure? Training, look, training's more than taking... Listen, I've just had this conversation with somebody else interviewing me. Too much emphasis on people doing pads and fancy pad work. It's a load of rubbish. You understand? Being a trainer is more than telling somebody to go for a run. Look at the great trainers like Eddie Forch and Angelo Dundee. You know, you've got to, they train fighters by telling them, giving them advice. Do a couple of rounds on the bikes, do a bit of skipping, do six rounds sparring, spar this guy. You know, fighters, at 30 odd years old, you've got to be able to fight. You've got to know, you've got to know all that. It's a case of stopping them from doing things wrong. So, like I say, you know, you'll see it with you'll see it with fighters. They get beat. Amir Khan being a prime example, and they go and find another trainer. They're finding somebody to tell them what to do, what fits in line with what they think they should be doing. But a great trainer won't do that. A great trainer will say, "This is what you need to do. This is where you're lacking. This is where it's all going wrong for you. Do as you're told." And some people can handle that. Some people can't. And the, the fighters we've had over the years who've done really well, Johnny Nelson, start to finish, Junior Witter, start to finish, Nazi Mamid got to a point when he was 23, where he'd won everything, beat everybody, had maybe nine or ten world title fights under his belt, made a lot of money, then cleared off. Do you understand? So, you know, our fighters were established. So these days, it is more than just telling somebody a training routine. You've got to know the psychology of the fighter. You've got to know what makes them tick. 
you've got to know when to stop them, when to push them, you know, when they're having a bad day, when they're having a good day. Uh, and knowing the fighter inside out, and that's what it is. And the best fighters we've ever had is the ones that we know inside out. And, you know, I've had fighters come to me of late, last couple of years, Nicola Adams, Billy Joe Saunders, Liam Williams, fighters who've trained with other, other trainers for a long, long time. And that's a big ask, really, because you don't, you're going in blind, you've got a good product there, you know, uh, Billy Joe Saunders was already a world champion, and it's for, it's for you to ruin or to embellish, that's where it is. And you get measured on that, you know, we've seen where uh, Josh Taylor has left uh, Shane McGuigan, and he's done very well under Shane McGuigan, um, my opinion is never change a winning formula. Um, and he, you know he's looking for a trainer and there's going to be a lot of responsibility on that trainer whoever picks him up and to make sure that he carries on doing what he's doing and he carries on winning because he's, I think he's a unified world champion now there's a lot of responsibility there so whoever takes on that job is going to deserve a medal because you know their reputation is going to hang in the balance when, it, when they train him so that's what you've got to be careful of as a fighter and you know I do like getting kids uh, like Liam Williams who's had one or two losses and they're at a bit of a crossroads in the career and you can see where they're going wrong and then you can put them back on the track that's that's you know that's a good thing for me I like that and I've done that with a few fighters um, so yeah being a trainer in this day and age with social media you're under the spotlight you're scrutinized left right and center but luckily for me I was in boxing training and training people 20 years before social media came out so I sit back and laugh you know what's going off in social media because you know half, half of the time it's that they're all the clowns it's funny uh, and so many people get influenced by it and upset by it and uh, you know back in the day when we were you know when we were uh, 2000 1995 when Nas was coming through you know Sky Sports was a big thing you were lucky if you got on that and you got the boxing news and, so, and you never had all this social media but now you know I call social media fighters where they do all the workouts on on uh, social media and everything's on social media then they get in the ring and they can't even fight so you know there's lots of falls and against it exposes you know gives more people exposure but in the same measure it also puts people up there to be scrutinized and, and judged now you spoke to my colleague a few weeks ago at the workout and you said you felt with Kel's last performance he sort of rushed in people putting pressure on this one round knockout things like that so what sort of performance do you want to see from Kel on Saturday night do you want to see sort of a comfortable points when do you want to see he's saying a spectacular performance but what as a trainer what do you want to see from Kel? Uh, look that's is, you've got to have that in your mind you've got to have that in your mind uh, how you think you're going to perform but we've got a plan for DeLuca and you know Kel's got to stick to that plan and then when he gets that plan working then he can you know he can put a bit more of his own work into it but his last fight he's almost leaving it, it, it for me it felt like he was almost left to make his own uh, his own his own game plan up and a lot of people around him were telling him he was going to knock the guy out and that's the worst thing you know you should never go into a fight thinking oh this is going to be easy I'm going to knock this guy out in one or two rounds it's never it never really happens in very rare cases so you know being responsible it's great if it comes if the knockout comes you know sometimes it does you don't expect it so you clip somebody and you get them but after that, you know, imagine you go into a fight and your game plan is to knock somebody out in one or two rounds and they get through them one or two rounds and then you aren't prepared to box for the next ten. You're stuck. You understand? The, 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 the formula should always be box, box, work towards a knockout. Not try and knock them out and then go back to boxing. It's too hard that way around. I do just want to touch on a couple of comments Kel said in the press conference. He said that he had cut corners in the past, but he does seem very fired up for this one. He says there's been no corners cut at all. From your perspective, did you experience that? No, listen, you know, I'm a trainer and I don't allow people to cut corners because that's going to reflect on me. And if he said he cut corners in every fight, well, how did he manage to beat Sean Porter then? Because he didn't cut corners. What he might have meant is, and I think what he means is, he might have cut corners outside of the gym. He might have stayed up later than he should. He might have eaten stuff he shouldn't have eaten. He might have had a drinking camp, who knows? That might be his, his, his case of cutting corners. But when Kelbrook came into the gym, and I'll say this categorically now, that Kelbrook is one of the hardest trainers I've ever trained. Not, not the hardest to train, one of the hardest working fighters, because when he comes in that gym, you had to kill him to beat him. So, in his training in the gym, no, he never cut corners. It was a case of holding him back and stopping him from doing more than he should have done. 
he might have cut corners outside of the gym you know what I mean he might have had a Chinese takeaway he might have had this he might have had some chocolate you know he might, he might have done stuff cutting corners regarding his weight and his recovery but when he came into that gym understand from the day he came back into that gym when he won the British title from Barry Jones he came in for, to be trained by me to fight Kevin McIntyre from that day onwards he's never cut corners in the gym in his private life and his social life maybe so but never in the gym Let's just move on to Kid Galahad quickly. Final eliminator, as I mentioned, against Marrero. How tough a fight is this? But at the same time, how focused has Kid been? I mean, I've spoken to him just earlier, and he said that Josh Warrington carrot is way, way out of his mind. He's not even thinking about it. No, he's, he's, he was back in the gym the next day after getting beat by Josh Warrington. He went on a treadmill uh, at the light centre in Leeds. He was on a treadmill. He trained. He carried on training. He's never been at the gym since. And some people might say that's wrong. No, it's not wrong. He's a professional fighter. And you never take your eye off the ball. And he will not settle. And he won't, even when he becomes a world champion, he'll never take his eye off the ball. He's that type of kid. You can never rest on your laurels. And nobody's all overlooking this, Maria. We're not even looking at Josh Warrington because we're not going to get that Josh Warrington fight unless we win this one so the full focus is on Marrero it's a tough fight he's dangerous he can punch you know uh, people say it's a, it's a banana skin I've said it's a banana skin in the sense that yeah you know it could all go wrong but a banana skin is something you don't see coming and we see we certainly see Claudio Marrero coming you know his, his game he's, he's had a couple of losses he's adjusted from them losses and he's come back strong so this is not a foregone conclusion by any by any means whatsoever However, nobody's overlooking this kid. You know, it could be a bad night for Kid Galad. He's done everything he can possibly do in training, in sparring, to beat this kid. And on the night, he's got to, he's got to show that. Last couple before I let you go, I do want to talk about Liam Williams. Haven't caught up with you since his phenomenal win over Atlanta's Fox. Big knockout. What can we see next from him? Uh, a world title shot by sort of the end of 2020? Same, same thing again. I don't know what's happening with Liam Williams in regards to that. All I know is he's back in the gym training. Uh, like Alan says Fox, he was in the gym for a long time because nothing was nailed down. We were backwards and forwards with certain things. And I said to Liam, and, and I said to Liam afterwards, the reason why you did so well in that fight, I can remember halfway through when there was no fight and I saying, oh, I need to have a week off. I think we're going to go away for a week on holiday. And I went, no, Liam, stay, train. This is going to come upon you and you're not going to be ready for it. And and he was in such a long camp for that, but we held him back, we pushed him forward. And when he came into that fight, he was probably the toughest guy he's ever had to fight while I've trained him, because it was the easiest fight I've ever had in my life. He had a game plan, he had everything, and that's where we're talking about cutting corners and, and, and knowing how to deal with fighters. I've de dealt with so many fighters like Liam Williams. The difference with him is he listens. The ones that didn't listen got beat. Do you understand? And he, he respects me for that because everything I've ever told him, it's, wor it's worked out. But he doesn't work without him sticking to the plan. So I was, I was proud of his performance. He chopped that guy down, six foot five, had the high to reach advantage, and Liam Williams made him look like a novice. He did. Whatever's next for Liam Williams is he's going to fight, he's training, he's just waiting for some opponent to come along, and then we work to a game plan. But the minute he goes, I've never done this, I've never been in, in camp so early after a fight, apart from when I've trained with you, and that's where it's at. So we'll see in the next, it'll be, it'll be a month or two before we know he's fighting, but he'll be ready. He'll be ready. And Robbie Davis Jr., first Davis fight with Jr., him on March Another good 7th. kid. Hopefully we can turn him around. He had a close fight with Ritson. Uh, great kid. Uh, loves to fight. He's having a good crack in the gym. He's fitting really well. And hopefully we can turn his career around as well. I, know, I just want to get you a prediction for the big rematch coming up. Fury and Wilder. How do you see that one going? I'm always going to go with Tyson Fury. You know, he has been a bit... You know, I've been saying that, you know, consistency in fighters is what matters. And, and Tyson's inconsistent. But... You know, he's consistently inconsistent, but he always seems to pull it out of the bag when he comes up with a big fight. And I always think with Tyson Fury, he knows what he's doing. And he's always going to cause people like Dento wilder problems. It's just how much Tyson has got his focus on it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it'd be interesting. I think Tyson's going to win because he got nailed with one shot in that fight, what dropped him, and he climbed back up. For him, he's got to avoid that one shot. Dento Wilder's going to try and throw more of those shots. And I think the more that Deontay throws those shots, I think the more Tyson Fury is going to counter back off him. But we'll see. I, I, you know, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm going to put my money on Tyson. Brilliant stuff, Dominic Ingle. Wish you all the very best of luck for Saturday night. Thanks very much.